Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge and welcome to Eldridge and Company. I'm visiting today with Hank Scheinkoff, an old friend, somebody I knew many years ago, who has made such an important contribution to so many and who is a communication specialist, although he's a strategist, he's a, a political advisor, he's a corporate advisor, a country advisor, and he's all over the world and he's very successful and he's never without a loss of words. Hello, Hank, how are you? Thank you, Ronnie. I'm doing great. And I'm happy to see you, frankly. I'm glad, yeah. to, glad to be with you. I'm glad to see you, too. I mean, uh, it's just, you know, are you working in this mayoral campaign? Uh, it's called I Took a Pass. OK, I talked mm -hmm. to a couple of people, couldn't make a deal. You know, our business is a business. Didn't like it too much. And I have lots of other things to do. So I'm pretty busy. How many mayoral campaigns have you been in? Well, let's see, citywide campaigns in New York City alone. Um, I've been in 20 city, 20 successful citywide campaigns and I've worked all over the world. So, you know, I'm not a kid, but this, it's still very interesting and it's still very dynamic and there's still great things you can do. How do you think so quickly? I, because I had to run most of my, the early part of my life. <laughs> I was running from guys with, you know, to beach up. I was running from guys with knives, guns, whatever it was in the streets, you know, I just ran and I had to run to make sure I would survive. So kind of interestingly at this point in life, I figured out the other day, you know, I had a moment, I said, you know, I haven't stopped running since the time I was about three. So it's time to stop running. Yeah, I've read all about you now. And I've, uh, I, I think because, I don't know, I, it's your persona now. And I think it reminds me of my husband, Jimmy, who never got rid of Queens, who never got rid of Brooklyn, kind of. Uh, is that right? I never got rid of any of it. You know, it was funny. I'd uh, get off a plane and, uh, you know, <laughs> I traveled for, I, I used to fly three, 400,000 miles a year working. And I get off a plane in Alabama and I had great ideas and I get there and I start working and they'd say, you from New York City? And I say, yeah, I am. Are you a Jew? I said, yeah, I am. And they look at me and say, you know, we like to have you over for dinner. I said, what, what's for dinner? He said, well, possum and taters. I said, I think I'll take a pass on that. You know, I never lost New York because I to lose New York would be to lose the very essence of, of my obligation. And my obligation is still to stay here and to talk about this town, not just in a historical context, but in what it did for people and what it should be doing for people generally. And you don't think it's doing that now? Well, I think the politics have changed dramatically from the period of time when you served mm -hmm. and when I began. I mean, I was in my first campaign, I worked for Herman Badillo, I was 19 years old. All right. Um, it was, that was, that, was that 69? Was 69. And it was great because uh, they said I had no idea what I was doing. I was parking cars, true story. I was parking cars in the morning. There was this big, park, two big parking lots at 179th Street and, and Hillside Avenue in um, in uh, Queens. And uh, I knew the guy. I knew the guy. His father owned the lot. And he said, "Make some money." I said, "Well, great." So I go and I park cars and I made a couple of bucks. So I had to put food on the table at you know 17, 16, really, uh, onwards and before that too. But the guy says to me, "How'd you like to pick up 35 bucks a week?" I said, "Not a bad deal. What do I have to do?" We'll show you. I said, uh, "I said 35 bucks a week. Let's see. That covers." Uh, Blonny Stone, 35 cents a shot, 15 cents a beer. That'll get me through the week. It'll be very good. And that's, you know, I walked into it. I had no idea what I was doing, but I liked the guy and I, they, I drove, I did, I did this. I had out literature. I drove, I didn't, you know, it was, it was great. It was a great experience. And I actually felt like I was with people I belonged with because they were like me, they were blue collar people. Mm -hmm. They wanted, they were interested in making sure that things just got just a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And was that Walter Diamond running that Walter campaign? Diamond, Walter Diamond. I met Walter Diamond, who, uh, <laughs> interestingly, Walter Diamond said, and he said, you know, he said, you're going to be somebody great in this business. I said, what are you, nuts? I just wanted to pick up my money every week. Walter <laughs> was the last of a, um, of, a, of a generation of people who were unschooled, essentially, who had gone through the Second World War, lived through it or served in it. And who got involved in politics, either they would because they were just very angry about the world or they wanted to make the people in power um, shudder a little and they wanted to make them crazy. And he did all that. And he died at 60 and broke. Um, it was terrible. Yeah. But, so you were you, you talk about your childhood. I mean, you it wasn't a great childhood at all. You know, but I'm, gr I'm grateful that um, I'm, I'm very grateful for the way it worked out. I owe a great, great debt of gratitude to a significant number of people. I mean, you know, look, I didn't live in an intact family after I was probably, my mom, my mother and father really walked out um, at the time I was probably five. Um, I walked, you know, I ran around the streets of the South Bronx. Um, well, we, it was already on fire. 
uh, with my brother and he was three or four max. I you mean, were from the Bronx, not from Brooklyn. No, Hunts Point. And- um, oh, Why did I think that? I think yeah, because I, li I, li I lived in Brooklyn. Gaskey, for Brooklyn too. I, I think of it because I remember you and Edward Gaskey. Okay, go on, I'm sorry. And, um, you know, I mean, it, it just, it didn't, it wasn't meant to work out well. Uh, my mother abandoned us, my father, couldn't keep it together and really he was trying to build his own life. They were very young. And uh, my, my they sent, <laughs> I got sent to a place called Green Chimneys in Brewster. But the, the good news is that I got sent there. The bad news is that my father never had any money to pay the bills. So the family that ran Green Chimneys took me in and effectively adopted me. Mm -hmm. um, and then I left and went to live with my mother again. And I, uh, uh, I my stepfather and I used to, he, she got remarried. My stepfather and I used to, I was trying to figure out who got the worst beating because I'd go into school, junior high school with, with black eyes, split lips and the rest. Mm. And in those years, nobody cared. There was one teacher who just passed, a fellow named Marty Cohn, uh, and he wrote a book about his life and I'm in the book and I'm grateful to have been in, I'm in a lot of books, I'm very grateful, but I changed his life, um, which is more important to me than what I went through because in my experience and what he called in his book, the worst, uh, the worst uh, child abuse that he'd seen mm. in his life at that point, it made him into a crusader for children who were similarly abused. Right. And, um, and I didn't see him for uh, 40 years afterwards, maybe longer. Were you what was called a pins kid, person in need of supervision? I, I used to avoid the cops. I mean, when the cops would come looking for me, a social worker would come looking for me in school, I had this scheme of never find them. They could never find me because I go and hide. That you was know, smart. I had the dean of students at one school looking for me. He was convinced he was going to find me at the cops out trying to get me. And I just avoided the war and yeah. I kept going. But how but did I, you I, high school? I mean, I, at 16, I didn't have, I had no money, no place to live. Um, so how, how did you land up at Green Chimneys? Well, I worked there in summers after I, after I left. I left the first time. I went to live with my mother and her husband. That worked, that didn't work out well because I, was, you know, the fist, the cuffs were too much. The cops were in the house every night of the week which kind of put things in context. And I had, to, I had to make a buck from the time I was 12. You know, first was paper routes that I'd knock on store doors. You know, in those years you could do it. These kids today can't do it. I mean, you're not gonna do it. You say, oh, Mr. Pan Cotidian, would you give me a job? No, I knocked on store doors. I said, you need somebody, you need somebody, you need somebody. I'd get things like uh, being a delivery boy or working, I worked in a textile operation where I moved bolts of cloth around. I mean, whatever it was. Um, so I went back to Green Chimneys because I, I had no place to go. I was 16, I had nowhere to go. And I said, uh, hmm. they took me in. I took me, I went to Brewster High School, finished up. I never thought, which was kind of interesting to me. Where Came did you go to high school? school? Well, I went, I went to three different, or four, by the time I went, finished school, I'd already been through, I would think uh, 12, at least maybe 13 schools. Um, my, and, and when I went back to high school, the uh, guidance counselor, Mr. Daly, who was not a bad guy, he said to me, look, he said, you know what? In those years, they used to talk about people in peculiar ways. He said, he said you're really not college material. Yeah. I said, okay, so you should try the service, maybe become a cop and or uh, get a job in a plant to get a trade because you're not going anyplace. And I firmly believe that. Nice. I firmly believe. Right. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, and I still, it's kind of, um, I'm, maybe a viewers won't believe this, but I have to tell you, this ripe age, old age, um, and my children think I'm wacky, but I don't get the whole Hank Sheinkoff thing. I mean, I just, yeah. doesn't make sense. Yeah. So. Makes no sense to me. It's interesting that the survival instinct that you have is really uh, incredible in the whole business. Anyway, you went to college though. When did you thank go to God, college? Thank, well, thank God for the city university system, which was free because mm -hmm. it was a very simple choice for me. I was just determined. I was, I was there's a uh, steel rod up my back which has both served me well and ill during the course of this life. And I refuse to give in. Mm -hmm. and to say I hate bullies, which is why I guess I got involved in labor unions and got involved in democratic party <laughs> politics. Right, I made you a fighter. And, right? and worked all over because mm -hmm. I hated bullies. But um, I, it was not for the city university. I wouldn't have, and it was free. There was no option for me. And I, I applied to Queens College, I got in. Uh, and, uh, but someone sent me this note, said you should go to Leroy College. I had no idea what I was signing, I signed it. And I went to the registration of Queens College with a fellow named Eric Morris. I remember his name to this day. And we both learned that we weren't going there. We were going to someplace called York. And I went there. It was the first class. Um, and I met a fellow named Edward Gowski, who uh, mm -hmm. had the show for many years and mm -hmm. created this. And uh, he um, became both an advocate and a uh, 
and a mentor to me and got me really involved in politics in a much more professional way. Mm -hmm. Also helped me become a teacher and, um, and encouraged me to finish college. I dropped out of college to and went back because um, I figured I could always make a buck. I was a member of the Restaurant Accountants Union, which doesn't exist anymore. You know, I worked at a place like the Carnegie and the Stage, which were <laughs> awful places to work. But, you know, I figured if you worked in restaurants, you wouldn't have to worry about making a buck. And my rent, I lived in a basement in Queens was 50 bucks a month. And then I, I got really high class and lived in a place for 100 bucks a month. So, um, you know, but Rogowski tried to keep me in school. And um, when I didn't have a dime, which was very frequently, and I didn't know where to eat. I mean, the cafeteria ladies would often keep me going. I mean, I, and, you know, mm. he took me to his house to feed me. Mm. And then he helped me get my first uh, real jobs in, in, as, in, in, as a political consultant and uh, helped me become a teacher as a graduate school, graduate students at Brooklyn College. And, um, you know, I think of him very often. Yeah, but you turned out not to be at all. It makes yeah. me love you. <laughs> I just think that lucky. That do you have, I mean, was it partly your, the fact that you were a Jew? Does that give you any strength? On the other hand, Jewish families don't usually behave the way your family did, right? I was, I was embarrassed and I still am to this day because I could never explain to people. I'd, mm -hmm. I'd make friends and, and places and then I'd suddenly disappear and I'd never look back. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are probably scores of people that I could have had developed long-term relationships with of some kind, but I never could. I could never look back. I could uh, never also explain the, the beatings and the rest of it by the cops were yeah. um, And my mother and her husband were nuts. I mean, when I told people what was going on and it got back to them, they complained and uh, about mm. how could I tell this to people and how difficult I was. I was not difficult. They uh, were difficult. I defended uh, myself. You're not difficult now, are you? Are you a difficult person? Are you, did your family find you difficult? I'm a tough guy. Mm. I, um, I'm still at this ripe age too. I was too quick with my hands when I was young, and I have reasons to suspect why that occurred. Mm -hmm. I never was a bully, and I never did anything outlandish. Um, I didn't like being seeing people pushed around because I got pushed around. Yeah, I refused to give in. I come from the opposite side. I think I, I never. I mean, although my family always worried about money, I never had anything that was suffering or anything. Yet I have this empathy for people who, you know, just don't have what I have or mean things. And I, it's very interesting what happens in our backgrounds and stuff. So let's talk about the world, sure. I guess. What's different? Um, different is that we have, we no longer value in my view, and I see it in politics and I also see it as, you know, again, getting back to university for a moment. City University allowed me to get a BA, an MA from John Jay, an MPhil, a PhD, and I have, I have a, you know, postgraduate training as well. But I, what I see is a very complex, very changing world in which the values that we think are significant to create civil society and to keep civil society going are less important than the politics of ambition. Yeah. And that is very deadly and dangerous. We yeah. don't have, we have a full time and a permanent, the guy named Aaron Holt wrote about this some time ago. We have a permanent class of political people who are less interested in the politics than they are in the, being the part of the permanent class. I absolutely agree with you totally. It's become a, a, a career instead of, I, I brought, you know, well, we both, I don't know, you're not, I'm much older than you. I grew up during the depression and Franklin Roosevelt. And I always had this naive feeling that you ran for public office because you wanted to do something for other people. And you believed the government could do that, not because it was your next job anyway. I, I sort of agree with you. I've become very, um, and I don't like to be cynical, but I don't, and I don't think I am, but we're not handling the things we should do. And well, we're not handling it, or we're not doing what we should do in very significant ways. You know, we talk a lot of, lot of nonsense, but we don't say, look, the tax code has got to get changed because we don't change the tax code. Black people can transfer money the way this is set up between generations. Right. Blue collar white people have no shot. We talk about, uh, about jobs going overseas and we lie. Deindustrialization was for corporations to make money. That's yeah. what happened. So we've now created a generation of people who are white who aren't on crack cocaine, but they're on, guess what? Opioids. Right. And yeah. we've done this in a purposeful, almost way. And we keep lying to ourselves because the people running for public office today need the money to run those campaigns. Right. And money is what drives it. And unless you have campaign finance reform of significance, it's going to get worse and people should, and I told this to my students some, some you know, several years back, I said, 
Don't be surprised when we have riots in the street. Don't be surprised. Why? Because people deserve and demand their moment and we're not giving it to them. We're not allowing them to be people. And when that happens, we have violence. And, and, and yeah, there's enough literature on this stuff. Right. The attorney general yesterday from Minnesota mm -hmm. mentioned the, the 1968 commission right. uh, on, on why we have these riots and what it was. I don't blame the Kerner commission. I, yeah. you know, I, as a- I as mean, a, they talked though about the, the two societies. We have now more than two societies. We're actually operating under three or four We're social fragmented. Societies. Yeah. We have we have black people, we have poor whites, we have people struggling to stay in the middle class who are all colors, and then we have the very rich. And the tax code keeps making that gap even wider. And this lunacy about high about Ivy League colleges and creating debt to keep those institutions going and the government subsidizing that that increasing increasing concentration of foundation wealth among universities is also despicable. We're letting public education die so that people who are very rich again can get more at the expense of those who deserve an opportunity. If this situation existed when I was a kid, I would been I would probably be completing my second prison term. Mm -hmm. And I knew guys who went to the can. You know, I knew the violence on the street. I knew all this stuff. Um, I, I saw labor unions and their good times and bad. I understand the violence and I saw it in campaigns around the country. And I saw it particularly in urban neighborhoods. I mean, you know. Yeah. What are we gonna do about the unions? How are we gonna help them? They've gotta go back to doing their job, which is redistributing wealth. Part of what happened in the post Reagan era with, the, with the, when he broke the PATCO, the, uh, mm -hmm. the Professional Air Traffic Controllers Union, what he allowed to occur after that point was for corporations then to do whatever they wanted and they did. And under Democrat and Republican administrations, they've largely gotten away with it. Right. We need a National Labor Relations Board, frankly, that that uh, interferes less in organizing and does what it's supposed to do, which is to make sure that unions have an opportunity and fair, fairly to organize. And we also need to be able to get unions to, uh, if you, you know, they really don't have a movement in many ways. I mean, I've worked for some of the most extraordinary labor leaders, both in the public and private sector, um, who really are committed to giving people opportunity. We've got to give them the opportunities to organize and the international unions have to get a movement going again, whatever it takes to get into the street and organize and wow. be prepared to go to jail. Barry Feinstein was prepared to go to jail. He's the guy that brung me into, as they say, brung me into the Teamsters. Mm -hmm. He was prepared to go to jail if he had to. The guys I knew would take any risk whatsoever to organize, pay yeah. a cost, pay a price. And they had to deal with the most corrupt individuals in case, sometimes, but they did. Yeah, we don't do that anymore. That's not, no, everybody is, uh, the unions have become a, a checkbook in many cases for, for political people rather than being, uh, being uh, advocates for real social change and for real redistribution of wealth. I mean, some of these contracts that the so-called progressive unions um, negotiate are really terrible, I have to tell you, or better, they should be fair. They could be much better. And the Amazon uh, uh, vote, was that, that was, very disappointing though, wasn't it? Was that an ill-chosen? Ill yeah, uh, disappointing, but not surprising. Um, you know, there are, there are law firms that are, that are Jackson and Schnitzler was one that comes to mind back. I worked against them in a couple of drives, union drives, organizing drives back in the day, but there, there are law firms that specialize and other firms specialize in union busting. That's their job in elections. The target of Bessemer, Alabama. I mean, I worked extensively in Alabama for the Alabama Education Association and for the, and for the trial lawyers and kept the Republicans out of power, helped to do that for about 20 years and then it all collapsed. But, um, and I was very proud, more than 20 years. I was proud to work for a guy named Paul Hubbard, who, uh, who was the head of the Alabama Education Association since past, who brought the Black Teachers Association and the White Teachers Association together and created a political powerhouse. Now, the problem in Alabama is that it is a right to work state with a history of hatred of outsiders. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's not surprising that it happened. Was that the best target? I don't want to second guess the retail workers and, and, the, and, and what they did. What I would say is there's got to be other places that Amazon needs to be challenged and any of these larger corporations need to be challenged because what we're beginning to see is exactly what does not benefit working people or help unions or redistribution of wealth, which is more concentration or more power the way it was for the Carnegies and Frick and all these other people that began the labor movement as we know it in the first case. Why, the unions, I mean, many union members have the reputation of, or it's said that they voted for Trump. Um, yeah. 
understandable. There's are, a there's are a they still at that ear, or are they angry, or is it that they're I don't know against they're the angry, people. they're angry, they're afraid. Um, there is the race is still the, an extraordinary divider. Um, if you look at the if, if you think about the country since uh, Reagan, and you look go back. Why did why did why did Catholics become Democrats? Because they like Democrats? No, they became they became Democrats because they didn't like the the anti-Catholic Republicans right. who, who beat, beat the devil out of Al Smith in 1928. So they moved. What happened when the cities turned to dust? From their perspective, the riots occurred. Yeah, they had to move their whole lives, their parishes, their culture, the social network to the suburbs of those midwestern cities. Particularly, they said, "Wait a second. Who's protecting us? Who is protecting our lifestyle? And Nixon shows up and he says, well, I'm gonna put troops in the street effectively. If you look at his ads, mm -hmm. right? and they guess what? They go in the other direction. Reagan yeah. is patriotic. They're sending their children off to war. Vietnam, whatever it is, they're going to war, coming back and standing on the assembly line. Yeah. Guess what? Patriotism strikes the chord because we taught that group of people to be patriotic, to build the country, to keep it going during the second world war and then to to give their children to the war in Vietnam and other wars. Then we have so-called deindustrialization. Who are they going to blame? They're not going to blame the Republicans. I worked right. in Michigan a lot, and I worked in the Midwest a lot. Mm -hmm. And that class resentment that is also colored by race is so significant. And we haven't found a way to bring people together at all, which you know, which which is really quite extraordinary. Well, you're a great strategist. Don't you have some ways of doing it? Yeah, I do. Look, I worked at Michigan, I remember a lot, but I, there's one incident in the last umpty ump that comes to mind. I've worked in what? I mean, I've worked in 44 states and I've worked in over, they say, over 700 campaigns. Um, I did the in-state campaign in 2000 in Michigan for the UAW for uh, Gore and Lieberman. And what I found was that if you, if you found shared values, that race would somehow be overcome. I mean, talking about guys that, you know, abortion, guns, the rest of it. Right. Don't talk to them about abortion guns. Right. Talk to them about how they're being beaten for money, how everybody who works for a living is taking a beating. Talk to them about the things that join them, not the things that separate them. Political consultants like me are responsible to some extent for this chaos because of, because of micro-targeting. And we've set people apart and against each other while trying to manipulate the electorate. And now what we did is coming back to bite everybody. We have to find common values, and those values have to be, frankly, about uh, collective wel welfare with a small W for all um, at the expense of the rich, which is where it's got to get to. Because unless you have that class bias, you're going to have people fighting against each other on race. So it, I think it's up to you now, since you've been very successful and have all this knowledge and money, I assume, um, to get some people together to, to, to start this. I mean. Here you are, this talented guy and with all these connections and you're, I don't well, know. What look, I used to think of myself as Paladin. You know, there was a character, the Richard Boone character from the 60s television show, Have Gun, Will Travel, you know, Wire <laughs> Paladin, San Francisco. Yeah. The phone would ring, I'd get on an airplane. Um, I would like to spend the rest of my life doing the things that, that might make the world a better place. I've tried to, I do a lot of stuff um, and always have. Um, at no cost, or I've never, I don't turn people in generally in need away unless they're crazy, but I'd like to, I'd like to fight for the civic society and the civil society. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that the so-called progressives complaining about people. I mean, I have to laugh at what some of these people have to I say. I agree with, I, I'm in total agreement with I you. I laugh and telling me about working for a living. I mean, they're not helping unions. They're not creating the location for people, the locus for organizing. They're creating another structure of power people. For what purpose, I'm not sure. And, and the purity of their opinions. I mean, the assurance that they're totally right all the time. Totally, uh, totally right. That's yeah. the problem. We see, we, we always get upset with politicians get into trouble because we often give them, we imprint upon them our own sense of what we think is right and wrong. And when they fail us, we become terribly unhappy. You know, note the, <laughs> what happens to public opinion polling. Right. Bill Clinton was a classic. I mean, there's a, scores of others. We become mm -hmm. angry with them for failing us. When in fact, it's our job as citizens to force them not to fail. Right. All right. We're at the end of this program, but I don't want to end the conversation with you. So maybe you'll do it again with me. Anytime. Right? Thank you. And, th and... <laughs> thank you. I, lo I love you. All right. Bye.